Okay, I want to give a very brief introduction to some of the proxies that are used for dating in evolutionary biology. So unlike in uh, climate studies, climate proxies where we look at ice cores, sediments, uh, corals, uh, speleothems, uh, what else do we have? Tree rings and so on. Here we have to look at uh, maybe some pottery that's found, some teeth, uh, some other organic matter that's found and we have to still figure out uh, how long ago they may have been buried and uh, not necessarily the temperature at the time but just the timing of uh, that particular uh, evidence or fossil or something else you found. So just to remind ourselves uh, we have already been through the uh, tree of life for hominins uh, going back to more than six million years ago we have uh, come into already the uh, hominids, hominidae, depending on whether you uh, include the orangutan and so on or not, you get different names, that which keep changing by the way. So, Ardipithecus group here uh, and then gave rise to Australopithecus, which coexisted with Paranthropus, which coexisted with uh, our hominin groups, uh, and uh, you can see that uh, we uh, evolved over these uh, couple of million years ago with Homo sapiens coming around only about uh, 200,000 years ago as we have been talking about. If we want to go back uh, in terms of uh, climate proxies, we have been going back typically to 65 million years ago and looking at Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum around 55 million years ago and then uh, ramping down in terms of temperature and CO2 mentioning rise of Himalayas. Time scale changes from precession to obliquity to uh, eccentricity and so on. In terms of evolution there have been uh, speciations along the way uh, so Prometheans, Lemurs and Lorises Tertiers uh, splitting off, producing New World and Old World monkeys. Uh, and then you can see here the last common ancestors of the monkeys and apes lived about 25 million years ago. So that split off and we came into lesser ape and apes and great apes. Uh, so these are the apes and great apes. So orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos and humans. So the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees lived between 8 and 6 million years ago. We do not have its remains. So obviously there was some ancestor before we split off. Um, and we have to date uh, the index fossils, so-called index fossils that are found. Stratigraphy in general is where layering gets formed over time because of climate change, tectonics, uh, rainfall pattern changes, ice ages and so on and so forth uh, depending on the time scale you're talking about. Um, so even as close as 200 million, uh, 200 miles uh, you can get different uh, uh, depths of stratigraph of uh, index fossils going from the oldest to the youngest so you can see that both of these must be matched to the same time because the stratigraphy is the same uh, the colors are different because different processes would have produced the layers here versus here depends on the sedimentation rate uplift uh, changes in sea level and so on and so forth so around 200 million years ago you have common index fossils here at two different sites so you have to time we are saying 200 million uh, miles and 200 and 400 million years so there is the timing that's needed and when you find index fossils uh, you can have the the climate uh, ge geological dating for the location and then uh, maybe there are ways to uh, uh, look at these uh, fossils to say something about them. So that leads to biostratigraphy. You can see location 1, 2 and uh, 3 and 4 and again time going up. Uh, here is the bedrock and you have various species clustering in different times. So you have group D, C, B and A or A, B, C, D if you went this way and you can see again different and here uh, the these species didn't appear only the uh, earlier ones are here uh, this one doesn't have this species this one has the same species but at very different 
uh, depth uh, or uh, in terms of here very different timing as well okay so here we're only talking about uh, uh, geological uh, times and uh, the changes in depths um, so you can see here um, how you have to so just make sure you understand older to younger so this one is uh, later in time than this one even though it's the same species these are similar groups but they are at different times whereas here we were talking about depth differences and similar times so these things have to be put together uh, with all the evidence you can get okay so that's biostratigraphy uh, the other one is called paleomagnetism so as uh, magma keeps coming up in the middle of the oceans like this is the mid-atlantic ridge here uh, this is from coolgeography.co.uk um, because the magma is uh, uh, locking in the magnetism at the time uh, it keeps flipping so you can see that uh, there is south here north here south here north here so when you find a rock that has uh, locked in these uh, magnetic poles so there are two poles the uh, geographical pole uh, which points to Vega or Alpha Centauri and so on so those are uh, different than the magnetic poles. so magnetic poles keep flipping and a model exists and uh, uh, standards exist to date the m uh, magnetic uh, reversals over time and when you want to date something special or specific uh, then you compare the uh, imprinted magnetic lines in that particular fossil or rock or whatever else you're trying to date uh, not fossil really it's the uh, rocks uh, to that paleomagnetic date okay so here is the paleomagnetic reversal magnetic north is here and it flips uh, to here remember what we talked about before about locating India uh, and other continents as they move so you have to carbon date them or uranium or some other dating uh, to see uh, at what time that rock corresponds to and looking at the magnetic lines so if the lines are uh, much flatter then uh, it's at a lower latitude but if the lines are much steeper uh, then it's at a higher latitude so that's a different kind of uh, geolocation dating whereas this is magnetic reversal uh, dating so paleomagnetism uh, is much more about uh, counting the flips and then dating them uh, back using the standard model of how often uh, magnetic pole uh, uh, flips okay radioactive decay wave already mentioned uranium 238 uh, uh, it's uh, unstable isotopically uh, radioactive so uh, uranium 238 has 92 protons and 146 neutrons and it decays by losing uh, two protons and two neutrons and gets a daughter uh, element that is thorium 234 with 90 protons and 144 neutrons remember the element is defined by the number of protons even the number of electrons can be different and obviously number of neutrons can be different so the mass will be different but uh, element will be different as well so if oxygen 18 uh, 17 and 16 for example all have um, eight proteins but they will have a uh, different number of neutrons uh, proteins protons uh, so eight protons but they will have uh, eight neutrons nine neutrons and ten neutrons for 16 17 and 18 so knowing the ratio of the parent and the daughter one can then date knowing the half-life of uh, the uh, parent uh, radioactive uh, uh, property okay uh, potassium argon dating each of these have different kinds of uh, uncertainties in them so I'm not going to get into those uh, here uh, k40 potassium 40 decays to argon 40 which escapes uh, the uh, molten lava as a gas so you can see molten lava has potassium produces argon cooled lava has uh, potassium so lava cools 14 argon cannot escape so decay plus accumulation gives you a old lava that's a mix of argon and protein so k40 decays uh, to a uh, argon 40 over time it is now trapped and accumulates uh, at a constant rate so 
these things are tricky. They are not uh, always. Uh, in other words, people also have uh, a, a estimate of the uncertainties associated with the potassium argon dating, for example. So the other way, uh, uh, dating or uh, uh, proxies are used uh, depends on not so much on these kind of radioactive processes, but non-radioactive processes where electron states are changed either by heating from the sun or humans or hominins heating material for making tools, making pots, making to, uh, whatever else they, they do. So that changes the trapped electron level. So over time, initial uh, level in the object, if you find a pottery uh, piece of uh, pot or uh, teeth, or not, not so much teeth, but other heated material, uh, then uh, sunlight exposed, uh, exposure empties the traps. So continued sunlight exposure keeps the traps empty and so somehow it, n it has gotten to this state and then sunlight exposure empties the traps so the s base state of the electron changes uh, and the object is buried at some point and without sunlight the electrons accumulate in the traps after it's buried. Uh <coughs> What we do is then, uh, when we find the buried uh, artifact, uh, luminescence emissions proportional to the time buried can be measured. So object is exposed to uh, light in a lab, and then you look at the luminescence uh, emission to figure out what time it was buried. Okay, So this is a very different way of uh, doing things. Uh, back to radioactive dating, of course uranium is a famous one because it has very long half-life, uh, 4.468 billion years for uh, uranium-238. There is uh, thorium-U34, uh, uh, 4.1 days. You can see how quickly that decays. Uh, so you get progressively uh, different uh, uh, so 1.17 uh, meter uh, minutes for protactinium uh, so uranium thorium radium radon uh, uh, and so on so i won't read all of those so these are called uranium series dating eventually leading to stable forms of lead okay so everything leads to lead so obviously you have to know the initial amount present and the amount you are measuring uh, of the parent and the daughter and the ratios are used in a geochronology chronology methods chronometers to produce uh, these uh, uh, dates okay uh, this is something I already showed tephro stratigraphy stratigraphy as we said is geological uh, def definitions that determine uh, changes in climate uh, like when we define now the Anthropocene it was done as a uh, way to represent human influence by Paul Crutzen, but then geologists said we cannot do it without finding stratigraphy evidence for the change from the Holocene to uh, the Anthropocene, so that has to be done as well. So here, when volcanic eruptions uh, happen, lava flow happens, uh, ash falls, so ash fall uh, a ash fall B here, so there is some site where you have dug up some evidence and there is lava flow uh, B on the other side and you have a site 2. So chemical fingerprints are done in the so-called tephro stratigraphy uh, where you look for uh, eruption A which is earlier in time, uh, so site 1 sample matches eruption A uh, and eruption B at site 2 matches uh, uh, the present day okay so uh, this is the earlier time and this is the present day I mean this is just a kind of illustrative ways of saying how uh, volcanic eruptions uh, leave like Pompeii is looked at uh, a lot uh, uh, for dating various things for understanding uh, what was happening at the time and so on so that's how the tephro stratigraphy works there is the trapped electron uh, principle where again crystalline structures can have uh, trapped electrons uh, with uh, which show up as lattice imperfections and then electron becomes trapped in the lattice imperfection uh, environmental radiation can create uh, a signature that is trapped in them and then when the material is found uh, evidence artifacts are found in the lab uh, it can be figured out as to when 
that particular uh, trapping happened. Uh, C14 is much simpler, so you have a lot of nitrogen-14 in the atmosphere. There's always cosmic radiation coming in. Uh, one of the neutrons can get knocked off, so uh, one of the protons, sorry, can get knocked off. So nitrogen has 7 plus 7. Uh, if one of the protons is reduced, it becomes uh, 6 protons, 8 neutrons, uh, so proton is converted to a neutron. If you have 6 protons, then obviously uh, it's carbon. So C, uh, 6 plus 8 becomes C14, which is uh, unstable, so it begins to decay immediately. There's a constant production, so atmosphere concentrations vary. We know how they vary, but generally there is a pool of C14 available which is being taken uh, up during photosynthesis. It's being consumed by animals, so constant intake by animals during their lifetime. When they die and get buried, uh, if you find past evidences, you can look how depleted it is, because once it's used in photosynthesis and consumed and put away, uh, it's only decaying. It's not adding more C14 anymore. So you can look at the parent and the daughter again uh, to figure out how old that is. So if you look at the decay, start with 100% uh, of the parent, 0% uh, of the daughter, and then daughter begins to increase, parent begins to decline. Uh, C14 has only a lifetime of 5,750 years or so. So uh, enough daughter uh, parent material is left only to go back to about 50,000 years, so that's only good for more uh, recent type. I will just read the, some of the other methods. Fission track dating uh, is based on the same principles as uranium lead dating, but the daughter product that is measured is not an element, but rather the damage made within a crystal. So crystal deformation uh, gives you a... a way to date. Because uranium is such an unstable element, the nucleus is capable of, capable of spontaneous fission, which means forcefully splitting the nucleus into two fragments of similar mass. The event is so for powerful that it can leave tracks of damage in the crystals uh, in which the uranium is trapped. Uh, scientists can submerge the crystal in an acid and make these tracks visible for analysis under a microscope. The number of tracks they that they count can be compared with against the uranium content within the sample itself to calculate the age of the crystal. Just get an idea of how uh, it is. Uh, these are calibrated, validated. There is a uniformitarian principle assumption that over billions of years the uh, decay time is not affected by changes in radiation from the sun and other things. Okay, So this method is typically applied to rocks that show the tracks well, such as zircons. Uh, electron spin resonance. This technique was introduced in the 1970s to date recently formed materials that cannot be dated uh, using the radiocarbon method. It can be applied to organic materials such as tooth enamel and shell, so this becomes critical for dating uh, evolution. This makes this technique useful because the teeth are the most common part of the skeleton found in fossil record. They get preserved well over time. Tooth enamel is primarily composed of the mineral uh, hydroxypatite, hydroxypatite um, which possesses two energy states, the non-excited state and the excited state. Natural geological radiation can transfer electrons between these two states. The ratio of electrons trapped in both states is proportional to the duration of irradian, irradiation, i.e. the amount of time it has been buried. So when it is exposed, it's going the, uh, through the process of uh, radiation, uh, electron transfers, but once it's buried, uh, it's uh, locking in that signature. Uh, this in turn gives an accurate age of the tooth. Great, right? Amino acid racemization. This method was introduced in the mid-1980s and refined throughout the 1990s as an attempt to expand the variety of dating methods to use for uh, of use for bio biogenic material. Amino acids can exist in two different mirror images, uh, mirror image forms, L and D type, that can be differentiated using polarized light. Living organisms only have the L-type amino acids. When an organism dies, amino acids can flip or racemize between L and D types. L-type changes to D-type at a steady rate until there is an equal number of L and D types. It's like an osmosis. The ratio of two types in an organic sample can be used to estimate the time passed since 
death or the time it got uh, stopped uh, 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 synthesizing uh, amino acids or consuming amino acids. Obsidian hydration uh, is a volcanic glass that has been uh, used by ancient and modern humans to make very high quality sharp stone tools and weapons. Obsidian undergoes a process called mineral hydration. When fractured, the material begins to absorb the water from uh, the air or environment at a relatively regular rate. This absorption forms a layer on the surface of the obsidian, uh, the material. Uh, the thickness of the layer that can, uh, can be measured and correlated to the amount of time that has passed since the obsidian was fractured. Archaeologists can use this method to date the manufacture of a stone tool amazing right now you know how we got all those things to synthesize timeline of dating uh, methods in human evolution um, tephrostratigraphy that we talked about dating uh, volcanic ashes uh, these are relative so they don't give you absolute dates okay uh, biostrat so they give you more recent uh, compared to the I mean the timing compared to the present day uh, so it's not uh, absolute Biostratigraphy and index foils, again relative as we talked about. Paleomagnetism that we talked about how uh, it flips because of the constant formation of the uh, ocean seafloor. Uh, in terms of absolute dating we talked about potassium argon, electronic spin uh, resonance, uh, uranium lead uh, can go all the way back to 4.6 billion years, uh, uranium series, series for intermediate decades here so be careful about the time uh, scale here I should have mentioned that before we have 4.6 billion years ago when earth formed uh, we know that also from uranium lead dating then you jump the time scale all the way down to 6 million and start looking at Cylanthropus chacadensis uh, and come down to our uh, closer relatives Australopithecus afarensis, uh, Homo erectus, uh, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo floresiensis and Homo neanderthalensis. So you can see here trapped electron methods, amino acid racemization, obsidian hydration and C14 are used at various time scales as we said C14 is only good about 50,000 years. Obsidian hydration can go up to 100,000 years. Similarly, acid amino acid racemization, and then you need trapped electron methods uh, and so on to go uh, to older times uh, for dating uh, various things. So, tools only go up to about 100,000 years. Okay, so. I'm going to leave this here. It's a bit long in terms of uh, timing, 22 minutes, but it's okay. Uh, and I read things a little bit fast, but it's a uh, introduction. So just uh, listen to it and be familiar with the words used so that even when you hear them elsewhere, uh, you can be sure what you're uh, talking about, what they are talking about. Okay.